Hey, this is a quick disclaimer. This is a brand new game from the Pokemon Company with online features, so there's not gonna be any tutorials or anything like that to help you replicate what you see in this video. It's only meant for educational and entertainment purposes only. Thank you for understanding. Hey everyone, it's Charlie, or I guess in the world of Pokemon, MC Sledge. I'm super excited to get to intro for this episode of Boundary Break, a show where our lovely host takes a game camera anywhere he wants to to try and find secrets and new discoveries to some of your favorite games. This week it's Pokemon Scarlet and Violet with the camera provided by Hebo. The hard work is appreciated, so links to follow him in the video description. And with that, let's see what's lurking outside the game's boundaries. Charlie, that was super cool of you to do. Thank you so much for doing a little cameo on the show. Anyways, like he said, let's show you what I found out of bounds. When you first meet one of the professors, their whole presence is on a television screen, and I was really curious about how this whole scene worked, and it did not disappoint me. So as it turns out, there is a texture behind the professor. But not only that, there seems to be an unused low-poly backdrop, too, that's three-dimensional. And all this is going on outside of Clavel's office. So while the game does use still images to depict the professor as well as the television screen, screen itself as you can see. There is a 3D mall that's always stored out of bounds. It's only the environment around him that may occasionally get called out. Another very early scene in the game is Clavel explaining the world of Pokemon, just like any other beginning to a Pokemon game. And if we zoom the camera out here, we can see this is a uniquely designed environment that's housed inside of a white box. What's really fascinating is, yes, he's housed inside of a white cube, but the white background is specially designed to have a little bit of a gradient effect and placed over that cube, sort of like a tarp. Now I want to talk about the Orthworm Titan and what it does out of bounds. It's kind of neat. First of all, as you might have guessed, its body is completely straightened out when it's underneath the ground. But what you might not know is that when it's traveling underneath the ground, there's a dirt mound at the very bottom of where its body was and physically travels to the spot that it's supposed to go to. Also in this cutscene when it sort of gets away and you have to do the second phase, it can show you the exact moment in which it disappears, which is honestly pretty soon after he gets off camera. But after that, he's very quickly loaded into his next position. Or should I say, there's actually two of them that are loaded in that position, which is pretty wild. In fact, one character being loaded in two completely different areas at the same time is not uncommon in this game. There's that spot in front of the mansion where you talk to Clavel and got your Pokemon, but that model stays there indefinitely even after Clavel comes over here to talk about your Pokemon battle with Nimona. The same can be said for this first boss fight here with Team Star. Although there's a flashback scene, they use the same exact environment that you were just in, and they never unload the boss model from said flashback sequence. And here's something that's pretty wild. When a Pokemon evolves, and they use this cool little psychedelic background, the camera is moved way, way outside of where the player was. Although I wasn't able to move the camera around while the Pokemon was actually evolving, once the evolution animation is done, we're left with the camera position of where it was, which is way outside into the void, and just trying to find my original player position was actually really, really hard. And I'm hoping I'm talking long enough here so that the players can kind of figure out where it was on the map, seeing as, conveniently, this wasn't even by design. At a certain point, we're doing the exercise routine with Dendra while our camera is still trying to figure out where the heck we were. And once again, I can't move the camera around necessarily while you're trading a Pokemon, but since certain character models will move around in the space that I can move the camera, you can kind of get an idea based off of where I was with this trainer, just how close this screen is to the trainers that you're training with, seeing as I can get her into the scene. And then we had a viewer request. As always, you can follow me on Twitter if you ever want an idea of what game I'm going to be covering next, as well as having the opportunity to see something that you would like to see in the episode. And the viewer request is about the gym arena when you fight against Larry. Now, sadly, there's nothing that special about it. It literally does just fade to black and unload the restaurant and then load in the arena. But by trying to fulfill this viewer request, I did find something really fascinating. See, Larry is the only gym leader where audience members rush in in a cutscene sort of way to see the fight. And because of that, all the spectators are stored out of bounds, and even cooler is that they're all side by side. And here, I can even show you the exact moment in which some of them start piling in for the cutscene. The ones that are left behind just kind of pop into the scene because they're not being used for the cutscene itself. <laughs> and again, so much of this is just found completely by accident. Here, I was just going to show you guys a zoom out of the false dragon titan battle to give you a sense of scale for the Pokemon trainer and Dodonzo. But while doing that, I also took the camera underneath the ground, and I saw that during certain cutscenes where Dodonzo has to swim away, there are stone-like orbs that seem to be tracking points for the boss. It also seems to be used to spawn in Don Dozo. Also, just to talk about another Titan, Iron Treads seems to shrink away when defeated. And if you take the camera underneath the ground, you can see a teeny tiny version of Iron Treads that still exists in the game's map. 
And now I'm gonna give you guys a zoom out of the entire region, but for a purpose. One of the things I wanted to explain to you is that Pokemon Scarlet and Violet use very, very aggressive frustrum culling. And a very quick layman's explanation for frustrum culling, it's a developer technique that's used to sort of hide renderings to free up some resources for things like frame rate, as well as adding extra detail to whatever the player can see. Now games tend to have different degrees of frustrum culling, and it's very surprising to see to what degree Scarlet and Violet has for theirs. Now we have the map completely zoomed out and as you're gonna see as I turn the player camera around the entire map just seems to get loaded in based off of the view perspective of the player you can see the frame of reference in the mini map that I couldn't even get rid of for this episode so it works out really well here but if you want to see it one more time I'll give you a view of exactly what the player is seeing in that point in time in the lower right hand corner now over the mini map and the rest of what you see on the screen here is what the game doesn't allow you to see also, some of you might notice that when you reach the school, the game has to load in before you get through the gates. Pretty much nowhere else in the game makes you do this unless you're going inside of a building. But of course, being at the school still technically has you outside. So what the heck is going on here? Well, as it turns out, because the school's building is so graphically intense, it needs to be loaded separately from the rest of the game. And in order to pull this off, the rest of the world map doesn't technically exist. It's just a textured dome to trick the player into thinking that it exists out there when in truth, it's just a picture. And now let's talk about something I always thought was really strange. There's this unused area over to the right of the map, almost certainly going to be DLC at a certain point. But for now, there is a landmass out here that the player can't get to. If you try to climb up there, you just slide right back down and there's no way you could possibly hover over there. It's just simply impossible. So what you're looking at right now is a low poly version of this area, which means that it has the least amount of detail that I could possibly provide for you. Just want to make sure that you saw that because I wanted to be absolutely certain that we get to see what the least the developers intended for you to see when you look from the highest point. But now I'm as close as you can possibly get. This is probably the most highly detailed version of the map so far before the DLC can be implemented into the game. And what you can see here is that it's just barren. It's sort of like a rock settlement that's placed on top of a rock settlement, if that makes sense. So it sort of looks like a mountain with its own mountain toupee. And there is what the game considers a higher res texture to represent all this rock, but there's nothing else out here. So basically you're just gonna have to wait until the DLC comes out to really know what's up here. But this is what's up here right now. And what you're looking at is a complete shot of the entire DLC area that you're just not allowed to see at the moment. All right, another viewer request was to see how far does the water go? And it kind of got me down a rabbit hole that was really fascinating. I freaking love what I'm about to show you. So there is an end to the ocean. It took a really long time. I had to speed up the tools and everything in order to get out here in a reasonable time. But needless to say, what I'm trying to get across here is that it would take a a very 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 long time to swim all the way out to the water's edge. The entire game's landmass doesn't even come close to matching the game's ocean. And you know, before I move on to what I want to talk about next here, it's kind of cool to point out, and it's kind of cool to point out that the ocean has sharp line edges. And because it's not spherical, you can count out all the edges and determine what shape it is. If you'd like to pause the video and tell me in the comment section, I'll be more than happy to pin the best answer even if it's not the factually correct one. And now this is what I think is really fascinating. The world the world of Pokemon Scarlet and Violet does not end with its ocean. <laughs> Despite the fact that it takes so long to travel across all of this water, there's also a blue void that the game developers implemented into the game as well, that I suppose is also supposed to represent the ocean. But that's not the game's skybox or sky dome, whatever you want to call it, it's not that. Because the sky dome does exist even well past this mass that exists even further out than the ocean itself. And so when we zoom the camera all the way out, I can show you what honestly it resembles like a planet, which I guess considering how large it is, you could call this a whole planet, but obviously you've been seeing me pull the camera back this entire time, so I don't even need to tell you that that small blue circle that's in the center of this giant planet-sized thing, that's the entirety of the ocean of the game, which is rendered all at once. There's no culling there. Pokemon Scarlet and Violet uses a lot of low-level detail models whenever they are just a couple of feet away, and you think that I would just crap all over them. But the truth is, is that I think that the character models for the Pokemon themselves are really well done. It may be that they had to be modeled by hand. And by that, I mean there is software out there that knows how to truncate models into a low poly form. And when you look at them up close, they can look pretty hideous. And while on that subject, I think that's exactly what they did for the trainer models, because all their eyes are really, really messed up. It makes for some very hilarious nightmares 
nightmares that you'll be having later tonight. And what I'm showing you here is only scratching the surface. Yeah, seriously, you could spend several hours either crying or laughing depending on your age group. Whereas like I said with the Pokemon, they're generally fine. There's only been a couple of instances where I feel like it was dependent on how the character model was animated that may have messed up where the eyes were placed and stuff like that. But otherwise, they're pretty clean. The only really funny thing is that the animations for some of the Pokemon get borked. I don't know why, but it's also hilarious. It's almost as if they're walking on a tightrope instead of a flat surface. It's very strange. Also, lastly, I want to talk about this Wiglet because even though this is the low poly version, it has a very highly detailed texture for the nose. In fact, if you take the camera pretty close here, it almost looks like it's made out of dodgeball texture. Just thought I'd share that. I thought it was really cool. Okay, let's start talking about some stuff that I found out of bounds. In your own dorm room, you got this door over here that leads to the bathroom, and no, sadly, there isn't a bathroom on the other side of that door, but what's really surprising is that the door that leads out into the hallway does have a fully modeled hallway that the player never, ever gets to see. Never shows up in a cutscene. You can't angle the camera to see past the, the other side of the wall because there's a black texture that covers it up. Nothing. So this hallway is completely unused. And then the elevators that are inside of every single gym also have a little bit of a texture that bleeds out into the void, signifying that it may have been intentional at one point for the elevators to be operated. Over at the school, there's this treehouse, and I apologize to any hardcore Pokemon fans that can tell me otherwise, but I'm pretty sure you don't ever actually get to go to this thing. Well, anyways, if you take the camera inside the building, there is a housing, no pun intended, I swear, on the inside of this thing that also has a fully modeled tree trunk inside of it as well. A level of detail I was not expecting. And if you go up to this giant window here, you can see that it uses parallax mapping. It's not a particularly impressive one, but it does have a floor that's green and a really, really low resolution texture that seems to simulate the windows. Of course, taking the camera inside will show you that it doesn't in fact exist, and this is a great counterexample to why the inside of the treehouse was particularly interesting because most building textures in this game are either rendered on one side or have back face culling. Also wanted to show you where the special cutscene caves are for the Titan battles. Every single time you beat a Titan, you're left inside of a cave to get a special ingredient, and then you're never allowed inside that cave again. So I wanted to show you where that is in relation to the overworld map because eventually once this cutscene's over the camera position that you're in will show you exactly where that cave was and it's usually a fair distance away from any mainland in the game but typically pretty close to wherever you defeat the titan like in this case it was the flying titan and for those that were curious yeah those caves that you're not allowed to enter after you're done with it this is what it looks like when you take the camera through on the overworld map it does have a housing it's just a really really shallow one and then there's nothing on the other side of that this cave in particular has two housings. One that uses the game's main rock wall, then there seems to be a prop rock wall, and then that black texture you see there is just the shadowing that doesn't allow the player to see any deeper. Also, fun little fact, the game does frame every picture that you're going to take, which does make sense since your character can be customizable, but it happens so quickly I could never show you where they're being framed from, but one of the cool things that proves that this is the case is that if I move the camera outside of its axis, whatever was the last thing that was on my screen is the thing that will show up as the photo for when you complete a challenge. Also, here's some out of bounds Pokemon, but that's not actually why I'm trying to show you what's going on here. No, instead, I just want to show you that just like how there's a texture that creates a shadow for a cave, obviously when you're in a cave, there is a texture to represent the outside light. And when you take the camera out, you can see the square shape that it truly has. And now I want to show you some low poly buildings. This is the school's low poly model. Honestly, what makes this really fun to look at any of these buildings is that they are fairly detailed for a low poly building. I will say in many games, you tend to just get like a cardboard cutout, but these are all fully modeled. And even up close, it's pretty easy to tell what every model is representing here. Another really fun one to look at is the Pokemon Center. Obviously, there's no character models all the way out here, but you get some nice strong blues, reds, and yellows to represent the individual stations at a Pokemon Center. And here's one more town in the game I wanted to show you. I just, again, these low poly models are really interesting to look at, so I wanted to share as many as I possibly could, you know, without boring you guys. And then although you do get to technically see this when you obtain a new TM, it's completely covered up by HUD, so it's very difficult to see. So I just wanted to take the camera inside of the TM machine and just wanted to show you that the discs are housed inside of the machine at all times. And because of that, I can give you a nice clean look at what those discs look like. Anyways, I want to thank Charlie and Hebo for helping with this episode. Also, in the near future, we're going to be hitting a million subscribers, and I do have a special 
special plan. It's going to be a documentary that's supposed to go from all the way back to before I started Boundary Break to where the state of the channel is now. I think it'd be a lot of fun. And also just super quick to clarify something for you guys. I noticed a few of you are saying where she says whenever there's a new upload from someone other than me. I just want to keep putting the message out there in case somebody doesn't know that I have Snipey as well as the Glitch Hunting Gamer putting out additional content that is on top of the two videos that I put out every single month. Definitely not going away. Definitely not working any less than I usually do. So hope you can appreciate the additional content. And with those two things out of the way, I just want to say there's an additional Pokemon video right here on the screen. And if you're interested on it, click it. If not, have a great day.